Joshua Pentelaresco. I write stuff and podcast and illustrate and broadcast too. I, I got to work on my slogan somehow, some way. My guest <laughs> is Brett Cousins. Brett, how you doing, man? Pretty good yourself. I take myself as serious. Like you said, I'm taking myself very seriously, as you can see. I've been spending my last couple days working on uh, getting ready for our draw and bid. Uh, my second illustration thing. I never thought I'd be doing illustration. I, I, I make an ass of myself on the air on a nightly basis now. It's fantastic. And well, uh, long as people think you're funny. What? <laughs> long as people think you're funny. Oh, I'm at least I'm funny looking. One or the other, right? So I just, I, I just, I am. No, man, I'm just, I'm just doing what I love to do. I mean, that's, I think everything that's happened in the last, this strange, bizarre year of this weird little time has made me kind of think, like, again, it, it just puts in perspective what's important. And I've decided that I would do for the rest of my life. I'm just going to do what I love to do. And I really don't care. Um, everything else is superfluous. And I, it, it's basically I've just evolved it into a completely different level. I've just given myself more permission to do crazier things. Because really, there's not much in this life that really matters. That's kind of how I, I that's, that's been my reminder of this time. How about you? Oh, just kind of plugging along. I've uh, still got my hand in my last career. Uh, just spent the last three days on a video conference in mineral processing. Every time they want to do a talk on grinding up rock, I go, okay, I'm go for a coffee. <laughs> my specialty is a little further downstream. Let's like center this a little bit more. That's okay. There we go. Okay. And but, uh, I'm looking to do a research project in that area. Unfortunately, pandemic kind of screwed things up. I uh, was going to hopefully run some stuff at SATE in Calgary here. I uh, mm had -hmm. about, about about three to five days worth of uh, chemical formulation work I wanted to do. And couldn't get anybody to sell me the chemicals to work in the lab with. So I finally set up a situation with a friend of mine who's got a lab down in Maple Ridge. So I was going to go down there and do it. And that's when, after Thanksgiving, every the pandemic numbers went way up again. And he said, please don't come to BC. And it's kind of like, okay, fine. So I'm kind of hoping to be able to go down there maybe in March and do that part of it. And then it'll ramp up for the whole bunch of test work that I'll have to raise money for and all that stuff. But in the meantime, I'm writing books. <laughs> well, well, that there are worse things to do, man. I've been writing books too and drawing them. It's weird. Yeah. I became more artistic in this time. I, I'm now the artsy fartsy dude. And I'm, I'm good with it. I, I'm good with being that, that, that artist, art, artist guy. How about you? Like, are you, are you enjoying this opportunity to do, to write more? I mean, we all I imagine being a full time writer, right? And here you are, it's the perfect opportunity for that. Yeah, it's um, do my sales pitch. <laughs> this is my latest book, number four in the series. Congrats! We're all basically standalone books. But uh, it basically follows a family through history. Mm -hmm. And this one takes place back in, uh, in medieval times, around the beginning of the 14th century. And has my main character travel along the Silk Road, back before it was called the Silk Road. <laughs> so it, oh, the research I had to do for this, just to figure out what cities would they stop at? What were they speaking? Having a bunch of people who couldn't speak to one another until they learned each other's language. It was quite the chore to put this puppy together. But, they are. Uh, Every book's a challenge, right? Every yeah. book has its own challenges you have to you have to figure out. Um, you know, what you research. When I did The Cloud Diver, my first book, I had to look up the 1918 Spanish flu way back. This was three years ago, four years ago before this happened. So that was um, depressing. Um, some of the things I found out. Yeah. That, but, I mean, it is what it is. Um, so... I mean, that created a different set of challenges. My current book, I'm looking up, uh, I'm actually just, I'm ripping off one of some of my favorite stuff. For me, I, I 
lost myself in my stories a lot more in this time. So, I mean, and that I find like that's basically where I've been getting my inspiration to be creative. Uh, for me, it's been Alice in Wonderland and Fahrenheit 451 and, and Nightfall by Isaac Asinoff, like some of the older classical stuff that I really, really enjoy. Um, yeah. but you, it sounds like you've just been getting your hands dirty. It's like, okay, how does this work? How does that work? Where, where? So I guess I'll ask this. Your fascination with that particular point in history, why? Like, what, 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 what does it compel you? What, what compels you about that? Well, this, that's the sixty-four dollar question. What point in history interests me the most? When I was younger, my mother and my sister would tell you if the book had a swastika on it, I bought it. I was fascinated by World War II. But as I got older, there isn't really any particular point in history that fascinates me more than the other. If you look at my first book, it's the Russian Revolution. If you look at my second book, it's Ivan the Great in 1460. My third book is World War II. My fourth book is uh, 1300s, uh, starting in Scotland and ending up in Japan and then coming back. So, I just, I've always been a history buff. Um, my first book, basically, I've done, I've been researching the Russian Revolution and the First World War for better part of a couple of decades. So this book didn't really take a lot of extra research. It was more along the lines of when, what days did things happen, and can I get my characters there at that particular day? Um, other than that, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, extra research to do. Um, the World War II book was very similar. It was sort of touch up. I knew the, the history of it. But Ivan the Great and Natashi, which were way back in history, took a lot more work in terms of uh, drumming up the research. The, the great thing about the Great Celt is I had, a, I had written Ivan the Great a certain way without ever really finding any decent research on him until I found somebody had did a biography on him in the 1950s. And I'm going through the book, reading about, you know, this is what he did, how he did it, and uh, his background and all this stuff. And, and it turned out that I nailed the guy. Like, how I wrote him was exactly kind of how he was, according to his biography. <laughs> was it, or, I mean, that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is you, you and him had a very similar take on him. Which, you know, like history is a really funny thing is um, we have, when, I, the farther back we go, the like, we're, like, we literally crossed an interesting threshold um, in, when the internet came about, because in social media in particular. Uh, prior to social media, um, we had pieces, like, media like, got better, as especially in the last century of recording things. So we definitely have a slant and a slogan and, and a logo about a, a, a truth about what has taken place, especially in the last 40, 50 years. But you go farther back, like you go past the, the digital age, past the television age, going back even to like just radio. We don't have a, clear, a fully clear picture. And the farther back we go, the less of a clear picture we have. So, I mean, Ivan, who knows, like, like we, we surmise based on whatever evidence we have um, that this is who he was. And that's interesting. And and the cool thing about that, and the cool thing about about older history is, you can almost retell a story about something that really happened. And that's and, and although it takes a lot of work, um, it takes a lot of research, as you will attest to, right? Um, yeah. Right. It it's at least for you, it seems it's it's a very worthwhile thing for you. Like you enjoy it. Is that? Yeah. And the further back you go, the less documentation you have, the more leeway you have. Yeah. I mean, that's that. I want, yeah. I still want my history to be as accurate as it is. Like, I try to drop my characters into actual events. As you go further back in time, uh, document, documented events are farther apart in time. So you got a whole bunch of space in there where you could have your characters do all kinds of wonderful stuff without messing with history because no one knew what happened between 1452 and 1458 
there was some war going on over there, but you're not over there. Your character's in Kiev or something. So it, you just, you could just make stuff up. Oh yeah, let's do the way back. I, I actually think we might be coming back to that point in, a, in for the opposite reason. Okay, and that's this, like today, everything's recorded. We are literally having a conversation that people are watching and listening to right now. Hi everybody, by the way. And the thing about, but the thing about that is, right? The thing that's really interesting and fascinating about this is, now it's the opposite. We have a glutton of information, a glutton of perspectives, a glutton of ideas of what we think is true. Um, it like when we look at when I look at um, it's so in one really interesting thing. I think we're almost coming back to the point that because there's such a glutton of information now, right? I think people are going to make more shit up as a result because there's so many narratives, so many perspectives on events that it, I almost feel like we have too much information today. What do you think about that concept? Uh, yeah, this is just, I can imagine in a hundred years, uh, historians are going to have all this extra stuff to go through and they're still going to go end up with a number of different opinions because someone else seen this somebody else has seen that but what about this and what about that and the documentation and then you gotta wait for it to be unclassified by the nia and nsa or something like it's, well, uh, like the, the whole idea like what we just went through with the trump era for instance how is that going to be recorded in a hundred years and somebody's going to do a little history on the trump years and how are they going to look at it because in a hundred years, the bias is gone, or at least yes, you no. should. Yes, and no. it, uh, I, and so you, you look at it with unbiased eyes, and you look at all his executive orders, for instance. And I, I actually made this comment a number of years ago. If you write enough executive orders, probably a few of them are probably pretty good. <laughs> he probably wrote some stuff that got rid of some crap. That shouldn't be there. There were a whole bunch that were completely the Looney Tunes as well. But of the fact is, there's some stuff he did which needed to be done. Okay. Um, he mm -hmm. did a whole lot more stuff that should never have been done. <laughs> so when you get an unbiased look at it, you'll start going, "Well, he did do this. Okay, he the wall was stupid, um, but he." He, uh, you know, he, he, it was, there's a couple of executive orders and legislation he put through, which actually uh, cleaned up the bureaucracy a bit to make it easier to get stuff done. But, he, you know, the way he did it, he did it so he could do stuff more. But at the end of the day, it was actually improvement in how government worked. That was one executive order out of the 3,274 that he wrote. So yeah, it, it, in a hundred years, if somebody writing history a hundred years from now on this time period, it will be a very interesting read. Unfortunately, none of us will be around to read it. But. Well, <laughs> one hundred and sixty yeah. years old, but <laughs> but this is how it, it, when you're when you're too close to the time period, history is written by written by the victors. When you get a hundred years out, one hundred and fifty years out. And you have historians who aren't married to the narrative of that time period. They start looking at other sides. Napoleon is a good example. Um, everybody hated Napoleon for the better part of a century. It is still some people still think he was a bad guy. But if you look at what he did for France and Paris, a lot of the cases, he, his war started by him defending France because everybody else didn't want the French Revolution to get it past the borders. And then he turned out to be a brilliant uh, strategist. Well, the and then, but, but he also rebuilt Paris. He modernized Paris because it was still a, a sort of a medieval city in the 1700s. And we swept away the aristocracy who didn't give a crap about anybody and, but themselves which needed to be done. And 
eventually, like most people, uh, if you look at human nature, you get that kind of power and you start putting crowns on your head, which is what he did. But at the end of the day, there was a, quite a like – France did not return to its previous self because of Napoleon. That actually spurred other countries. It spurred – and even in Britain, it spurred uh, more – liberalization of how the society operated in Britain. And then you go to Eastern Europe and they just ignored it. And then, you know, a hundred years later, they all fell apart after the first world war. So you can rehabilitate Napoleon to a certain extent. You can look at any leader and find even Hitler you find good qualities about him too. Doesn't mean necessarily what he did was it's interesting. Yeah, it, it's hard. It's hard to rehabilitate Hitler, however, because there's, yes, it, well, there's a whole lot of records of the bad stuff he did. Oh, sure, absolutely. But the thing, but the, okay. I mean, just just going with your argument for just a second. My own opinion is different, but let's go with your argument. When Hitler took over, Germany was starving. Germany had just been through a great depression, but they also had gone through a hyperinflation. They were desperate, looking for someone to fix things. He strengthened the middle class. He brought jobs back. He brought trade back. Within a very short period of time, Germany became a thriving economy again. Now, you know how he did that? With U.S. money. Yes, he did. Because he was, he was going, he was a bulwark against communism in Russia. But but he, he, had, a, you know, he had a lot of outside help. Um, Henry Ford was a big advocate of Germany at that time. Oh, yeah. Right. But I mean, the thing, but the thing about it was, I mean, you just look at it from that perspective, he did a lot of good. Now that came at the expense in the long run of what he did later and during it, his time as leader with, with Jewish population. The fact is he, he, he brought chaos in Europe. He completely like how Europe did things, how wars were fought. He completely altered that forever. Right. Yeah. And I, I, I don't think anybody would argue that what he did for war was a good thing. I mean, you look at Trump today. I, I don't quite have the same opinion of Trump as other people. I see him as the inevitable result of the United States picking the same people all the time. That's why I see him. Oh, yeah. Right. He got, he got in because right. the Democrats put Hillary up, which was the wrong person to put in. Period. They go, it's her time. No, it's not somebody's time to be president. I don't no. care who she or he is. No, no, it was just, it was just like, like I said, he was the inevitable result. I think he's more bad than good. Um, yeah. He was a monster, but I, I think, like I said, I will be very interested to see in a few days, weeks, months to come because Biden has a track record too. And you look at his track record, it's not. It's not that great. No, it's not. So it's one of those situations when you look at it short term, long term. Now, is Biden better than Trump? Almost certainly. Oh, anybody. But, 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 but I mean, that's, that's, but again, that's not exactly a high bar. No. So, I mean, I look at, I look at, I mean, looking at the United States just from that perspective, I just, I see them just repeating their own history. That's, that's what I'm seeing. And good, bad, or indifferent, they have done this before. It's not to this level, not to this extreme, but much like anything else in history, he, they, those who do not learn from it are doomed to repeat it. And that's what I see going on in the United States. Um, there's a pattern to it. And you can look and you can see it just in terms of the people that have been in power there for the last 60, 70 years even. Um, that's right. But going to what you're saying, it's like, Hundred years from now, I don't think, like me personally, they're going to look at Trump as a monster. I don't know if they're going to look at him as the greatest monster. That's that remains to be seen. We're going to see what happens in the next decade or so, and what comes down the pike. But I mean, definitely, like he made an impact. There's a lot of things he did that aren't so great. Um, the, the, the Nuremberg style rallies, the fake news. I mean. Some of the absurd shit he did, like the wall. I mean, this is not going to be. He's not going to be remembered fondly at all. And well, he, he he's made, also, yeah, he's also uh, the reason that, um, like most racists in the states at this time, uh, stayed in the closet until he came out 
And then they thought they felt comfortable being in public, being like that. And it really became disruptive to the country. Uh, it's more than that, unfortunately. That 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 has been there for as I live. It, oh, it's always been there, but you never saw it as blatantly paraded through the streets, so to speak. You'd be surprised. It depends on where oh, you go. Not in recent history. Yeah, I, I yeah, I remember there was I, I, an alley in Madison Square Gardens in 1937. But <laughs> I lived there, right? So I, I know a lot. Of, like I get the. I've lived in both Arizona and, and in Michigan. I can see, I, I can, I see where there's a lot of biases that were still there. What Trump did, and this is what this is what he, um, this was a terrible thing about what he did, was he the 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 schisms that were there. He open he openly um, pit people against each other yeah. with how he did things, and that that was terrible. Um, he took it farther than a lot of other, like a lot of other presidents have. He's not the first president to do it, right? But he's, the, but he's the one. But he took it to such to the, such an nth degree that um, the, the United States. I think the real, like the real issue, if you want to look at it, like from modern. I think John Stewart. He said this once on his show, and he was interviewing Ann Coulter, and Coulter was saying. You know, it's a liberal conservative. I say no, it's not. Like he actually said, like that that debate kind of has already been settled. It's about moderation versus extremism. And what's happened, and what's happened in the United States is is it's become more polarized in extremes. There's not much of a moderate the, left. The, yeah. the, the, no, the mod, the moderate, the people that the people people have stopped listening to each other. People have stopped compromising with each other people have said well they're they're this and they're this and they're not really talking to each other anymore they're letting uh they're letting they're letting other influences manipulate people's opinions one way or the other and well, unfortunately people are profiting from it that's the united like that's what's going on in the united states is what, what you're seeing is you're seeing you're, you've seen an, uh, an investment of time that's been put into dividing the populace in the united states and it's worked there's at least two different Americas in the United States, maybe yeah. more, right? And it's just, it's a matter of, like, it's a matter of just looking at where, like I said, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next four years, because I, I'm like, you still have a very polarized, uh, divided nation that, and both sides don't feel listened to, and both sides, I think, are right. But until they actually have that meeting in the middle, I don't see it getting any better. I see it. I see it getting worse before it gets better, and that's unfortunate. But that's just how I see it. Um, everybody's guilty of, some, of of this to some degree down there, um, but you know that's my opinion just based on what I've seen and how I lived down there. So yeah, I was down there for three years in Nevada, yeah. and it really struck me odd that here you are in the country as two parties, they're entrenched, and the 2016 election, neither party learned a thing from it. No, like, and there's a whole bunch of progressives looking for a voice, and they're in the Democratic Party and they're not being heard. And this is why Bernie Sanders keeps running, and the uh, and the establishment keeps pushing them aside. They're not going to be able to do that. Eventually, the what they really need two or three more parties where people can actually, you know. I like this guy as opposed to one of the two other choices we've always had. That might open things up a bit. It'll fragment the population a little better, but now no one's going to be able to uh, run with stupid agendas. Uh, that's not true. It like, might, because if you have three or four, they're going to have to find some way to compromise to get anything done. I... Bring that compromise back to what the Republicans and Democrats used to be like back in the seventies and the sixties. I, I okay. Um, hmm. I don't think you're going to get that out of the two parties anymore. No, I. Hmm. How am I going to put this? I don't think it's about more parties. I think I look at the fact that I think North America is still. I think ultimately what it is about is ultimately the role of big business in North America and how business, how it's gone, it's basically in bed with the politics 
not just in the United States, but even here too. Oh yeah. Right. So you don't, until that changes, that is, I think the real root of the problem. I mean, okay. Like, I mean, the United States makes too many guns. I don't think anyone would argue that point, but on the same token, I mean, guns are a part of their culture and always will be to some degree. Um, so you can't completely get rid of them, but you also, have, but, you, but who's benefiting from this divide? People that make them up, make the weapons. The, the COVID thing. I mean, there's a, there's a, I mean, the insurance companies are making a killing from this as much as anything else. I mean, there, there's, I mean, there's a business, there's a business to how our country is run and anyone that says otherwise is kind of lying to themselves. And that's kind of like, and until that changes, I don't think parties make a difference. I think until we get to the point where we're like, okay, let's go back into investing in our people again, not companies, but people that actually want to do things and change things and make things better. It's not necessarily about the buck. It's about, you know what, let's actually make a better world, not let's make money and exploit each other in the name of a better world. I think there's a big difference. And yeah. um, well, I said, if you stick with the two parties they got now, I don't see that happening. There's you get some multiple right. parties, you'll have some guys who are going to be able to push that better. I don't think, I don't think, I think down there, I, I think that like the multiple party thing, it's too little too late. I, I think at this point, um, they're stuck until they hit rock bottom. They haven't yet. That's just that, and we, and I mean, heck, that's, <laughs> that's how it works, right? I mean, look, human nature, we don't change. We don't, something I, le I, I learned in the last, like watching things like Amazon and Walmart rise to power. They rose to power because of convenience. Walmart has everything in one stop and it's cheap. It's convenient. Even though they don't, even though their products are crap. And even though they, they don't provide, they actually end up, you end up, paying more money because this this company exists you lose it in your jobs and you lose it in other other hidden ways yet people go to walmart still why it's cheap amazon is made a fortune in this last year right he is by far one of the richest people if not the richest one of the richest people in the world and the thing is i mean he undercuts storefronts supporting businesses like he he destroys not just the business sector but our housing sectors too right and but he's convenient we tend to we as a culture tend to go with the path of least resistance and most convenience until we have no choice but to change i've never seen it not go that way until we basically have no choice well, so. that, yeah, that comes down to human nature and, you know, people will generally go by the path of least resistance. And even like in the mining industry, uh, innovation is frowned upon until it's almost forced on. Them. Yeah. Because this mine is going to close down unless you buy that piece of equipment and freaking install it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they will resist it until the last minute. Then they'll either, you know, okay, we got our money. Let's uh, sell this mine off to somebody else and walk away. And then the other mine people come in and go, well, how are we going to make this work? And everybody goes, well, here's 15 reports we've had <laughs> about improvements yeah. to our system that will make this work. And then they'll resist it because they don't want to spend the money. They're expecting it to just start generating money. And yeah, you're and most corporations have quarterly reports, quarterly dividends, and most shareholders only want to know what where where's my next dividend? Well, yeah. Can you and so you know, they push. Make my dividend better. Uh the railway railroads in Canada went through that. Some guy come in. I won't mention his name because we're live. <laughs> Although I think everybody knows who he is. Comes into comes into a real Canadian railroad, says, I'm gonna increase shareholder value. He cuts and slashes maintenance 
on 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 the rail on the rails and the trains and everything else, and he's in for five years. He gets his golden parachute. He's gone after five years, and suddenly trains are starting to derail left, right, and center. When they didn't have a derailment for thirty years, because he cut all the maintenance to lower cost, so there was more money in profits for the shareholders. And they all thought he was a great thing to slice bread. And in sixty-four dollar question: If you knew what he was like, you sold all your shares when he left. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's most shareholders are only looking three months ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I don't want to spend any money. I just want a, the corporation to make money. And innovation costs money. Research costs money. And there's not a lot of it going on. Change, change yeah, I know. And now, but ultimately, change is inevitable. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, in that's, the end, yeah, in the end, you need a guy like Elon Musk who doesn't give a crap. I got a couple of billion dollars. I'm going to generate the research to build electric cars. I'm going to generate the research to send a rocket that can go up do something and then land back on earth. You don't have enough visionaries like that with, you know, 50, 60 billion dollars to play with. Most don't corporations have don't have that kind of vision. Uh, but those are the guys like Henry Ford was a good example of somebody who had vision. Mm -hmm. But then he also, this is the other flip side of the coin. When he becomes so dominant because they have that vision, like Bezos has a big had a big vision about selling stuff online. Now he's a dominant player. He tries to bury innovation. Yeah, because or because, buy it, use it himself. Well, it's 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 the nineteen twenty railroad problem all over again. It's that's what yeah. it is. It, it's what happens is you get these really innovative people, and they they win and they succeed. I mean, some by hook or crook in some cases, but they succeed right regardless, and you come to a point where you're on top and you want to stay there and that's human nature too look no one no one wants to walk away from a good thing no one even when sometimes it would be better if you weren't there that's the hardest part can you i mean no one does that um right you, you try to stay as long as you can to get the most out of what you can because that's that's human again that's human nature to some degree is you're there Right. And the thing is, when you have as much money, I mean, the, I mean, talk about French Revolution. I mean, they're more, they have a small percentage of people have more money than the French Revolution ever had. So, I mean, that's, that's crazy. When you sit there and think about that, that, that means that the world's direction essentially is controlled by the wealth of a very, very small group of people. That's frightening. And your hope. And her, their whole point in life is to stay on top. Sure. And not let, it, let anybody new come join them. That's and true. if they do, they turn out to be just the same as the rest of them. Well, no, you. Well, you, it's 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 not about turn out to be. The same. It's like okay, I'm actually reading a comic called uh, B Billionaire. It's Billionaire Island. It's 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 a parody, but it's got some bite. And in the intro, you know, people talk about the fact that uh, and he talks about this, right? Everybody always says to the billionaire, well, why don't you, like, you could literally, Bill Gates could fix Flint, Michigan over, like, a year, spend his own money, not even notice it, right? Really not even notice the cost, right? And Flint, Michigan would be, because of all the water issues, the infrastructure being completely, you could restore it, like that. Wouldn't cost him much. He wouldn't even notice. Bezos is the same. All these, all these guys most of them wouldn't even notice and the and the fact of the matter is they don't and what and, and the more interesting question that was asked is well why should they because there comes i mean because of the same to get to that level to get to that level of success to get to that level of money you are fighting tooth you fight tooth to nail for the most part for the most part even if you even if if your parents had a fortune that had gave you started that level of success takes your, I mean, no one wants to give you anything in this life. I, I mean, the one thing I learned as a freelancer is you've got to be willing to go and go for it. You don't, you don't just not show up and do it. That's just, that's reality. You got to be willing to fight 
Well, those guys are some of the meanest, most rude. How to become mean and ruthless to get to where they're at? Of course, they're going to be a lot alike when they get to the top. Yeah, and that, that's you know, and that's what it is. They, you, you, Microsoft's a perfect example of uh, anything new and exciting that came along. They just here's here's a couple million dollars. Thank you. Gates. We'll, we'll put it into our system. Bill Gates. Uh, they were putting putting Microsoft Office, well Microsoft, uh, whatever, the uh, three point one and Vista and all that stuff. Um, putting it on every IBM style type computer that was being built in North America. Yeah, because, he, because when you get your computer, you open it up. Mm -hmm. There's Microsoft. That Steve Jobs went the other way. He had a had a better system with Apple. Oh yeah, but he oh. kept everything there, so they never got as big until much later. Yeah, the funny story about Sony. Mm. Sony developed both the Beta and the VHS VCR system. Mm -hmm. The Beta was the better one mm -hmm. by far. So they licensed the VHS one. What happened? Beta died because no one wanted to buy it. The VHS system was a lot less expensive. And it worked. Didn't give you the same clear picture, but it worked. At that time, nobody was looking at HD and stuff like that on TV. Beta so went by the wayside eventually. Sony basically killed their better machine. Mm -hmm. Better doesn't necessarily mean it survives. Like I remember, like back when I was a kid, back in the days when you could record everything on TV with those beta tapes. When you got the biggest VCR, VHS could only hold like one movie, if that, like barely two. Yeah, a beta, a beta. You could record three, four, five movies on one tape. Yeah. Like well, the story, wider, it was basically just a wider tape. Yeah, really. yeah. Well, wider and, tape, smaller thing. And the, right? and the beta and the and the the hardware that you bought. I don't know about this. My mother's husband's sort of an audiophile. Of course, he had like two beta machines. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, they're better. And they're he still better. got two beta machines. He just doesn't use them anymore. <laughs> But you know, this 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 is the one industry where you can't stand still in is electronics and internet and like and IT stuff. Things keep changing. Mm -hmm. And this is where the Googles and the uh, and the Amazons and they get really big, but they still can't just sit back on the laurels. Well, it, because it, this industry is changing all the time. There's always something new coming out that they have to stay on top of. So I remember, which, not, which makes them a little bit more innovative than the rest of the world in general. Actually, it's not that they're more innovative; they're just smart enough. That Bill Gates said this back in when I was in high school. Bill Gates was was I remember this because I was in my communications class, and this is when Windows. This is right before Windows. This was Windows ninety five. So this is how old this is, ladies and gentlemen. I'm old. Shut up. But the, the thing about oh. but, <laughs> but the thing about it was, um, I remember with like he was having this conversation. Bill Gates was never worried about IBM. Didn't scare him one little bit. No, he was more. He was worried about the guy in his basement. He was more worried about the guy in his basement because he goes because what he said was, and you said this even then, was the guy in his basement is going to come up with something innovative because of necessity. We don't because we are so big. We don't think in those terms of necessity anymore because we, we can't we don't need to and we have other issues other problems so i always look out i try to look out for those little guys i will buy them out and sometimes force them out like the reason look my computer oh, has, them in. yeah what or, or some or look my computer has microsoft edge which is internet explorer 2.3 whatever the hell it is i don't use internet explorer I don't no, care if you use it. No, 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 no one uses it. Yeah. But it's on every computer system still in North America, pretty much, right? Linux is a superior system to Windows. I mean, I mean to show you so like some things are universal. Linux is superior in practically every way. But everybody uses Windows. Why? Who control it's a distribution. So and mm -hmm. and so when you look at Amazon, Google, all these guys. They look for these guys that are coming up with these new things that will buy them out. Sometimes they'll just outright buy buy them out. I've I've heard some interesting um, 
concepts with, with uh, Google and writing, what they're looking into in terms of what books are. And it's really fascinating what they, what they found and immediately just invested in once they heard it. Um, they're always, like I said, it's not that the big companies are innovative. They've learned a long time ago that the guys that the guys they're worried about are people like me or people are anybody that's creating their own enterprise because someone like us will not just look at the conventional way of doing things. They will be looking at, okay, how can I get bigger? How can I scale bigger? How can I grow? Let's say tomorrow you find a way to sell books. No one else has done, right? Hard to hard to imagine, but, it's, but 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 I mean I'm being I'm being because all everybody's but the thing is everybody's trying different things and we're all trying to be innovative in our own ways, right? It's about being aware of whatever market you're trying to go after. That's a big part of, of the writing gig. But the thing, but but what I'm saying is, let's say tomorrow you come up with a way that overnight you're selling ten thousand books. Big publishers would be con would be find would find you. How the heck did he do that? And I'll call you. How the heck did you do that? Right? Because that is not a small number in book sales today. Right? So some right that is not a small number. Right? So that's that's kind of where that's kind of where let's say you figured out a hundred thousand books. I mean you'd be happy. You'd be like, damn, I don't have to, I don't go mining anymore. I can just sit at home and I, I can find my favorite part. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, right, right. But but the thing about that is, right, the, but the thing is, let's say you find that. The moment you find that, everybody and their mother is going to look at you and how you did it. Because that, that's how it works, right? Someone that, right, there's all there's that constant, like, change necessitates um, looking for new ways of doing things. What happens is when somebody finds, I literally interviewed somebody on Monday. He found a niche no one served. He found it during the pandemic. He's now I, as a crowdfunded comic book like enterprise. He's doing fantastic, right? In a time a lot of creators are struggling, he's thriving. So well, all all of which to say is there's always that there's that struggle for change. And the big companies never take those risks because they don't have to. Why? They're already making money. It's guys like you and me that are going to take those risks because we don't have the same luxury, right? We, we're the yeah. ones, right? We don't have those luxuries. So we find something that really, really works. Then the next day, they will find us because they're going to want to know what we did and how we did it, right? That, that's, that's how it works. Yeah, and then they give you a pile of money to help them do it. Exactly, or maybe not. Well, you know, you're very correct. You know, um, again, because I said IT is so innovative all the time, you can't sit on your laurels. And you're right; they keep an eye on the little guys because innovation never comes from the corporate office. Well, innovation doesn't come it, okay. unless, you, unless you're. You're trying to find some way around frauding, defrauding people on Wall Street. I don't know. They get creative that way, but <laughs> it's it's you're right. This little guy in the basement who comes up with something, and I don't know if some creative people are good at selling this stuff. I don't think you, there's a lot of them like that. Like me, I'm not really. A, a, I, I tell people I'm a good wingman. I'm not really the marketer sales guy and it, it as, as a one-two punch when we were around in the mining industry sales guy opens the door he says we got this great stuff and here's brett he'll tell you all about it i ask the questions what's your system where we where we you know the problem is this blah 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 we we work it out we have this great product we run the test work and then the guy makes a sale and I've met sales guys who consider me a threat. I'm going, why? I don't want your freaking job. <laughs> I hate cold calling. I can make you look like a million bucks. And there's a lot of people who consider that a threat for some reason. But I find that a lot of creative people I know don't really have the ability to, you know, you, for instance, are one of them who, you know, you got a podcast and it's off and running. 
And when you get me into a conversation like this, it's the same thing. Oh, we're off and running. I can, I can uh, tell you my views and everything goes fine. But there's a lot of people sitting in the basement with some really great ideas that have no idea how to get them out of the basement. Well, it, it's... The internet's it, making it easier. No, it... But it still it, happens. It is and it isn't. Here's the challenge of the internet, okay? Yeah. I'm doing a show right now. I have other buddies doing shows right now. They're not competition. It's not that it's, it's not about competition. It's about the idea that you have to recognize the fact that this is a writing thing. There are thousands of books out there. Yeah. What a lot of writers tend to forget, and I'm going to say you probably are one of them, right? Every story has been told. I'm not trying to belittle the story you're telling because honestly, there is something you bring to the table that nobody else has. And that's you. Yeah. This is your, your passion, your voice, your tone, your, the story you tell, how you tell it is completely you. There is nobody on this planet that can duplicate what you do. Period. I had a, a guest go to me, like a diamond dozen author, on the air. I was like, no, there's no such thing. It's not it, – every voice is unique. Every person is unique. The challenge creatives have – this is the honest challenge. Who are you as a creative? As a person, what part of yourself um, are you willing to share to the public that makes you approachable? Now, you want your stories ultimately what they come back for. Every, every author, every creative – your story, your art, your music, your whatever that is that you'd love more than anything else, that's what you want people to come back for. You don't want them necessarily to it's not you don't mind that they know you, but you don't really care about that. You're proud of your work. You're proud of your work and you want to share it to the world. That's your thing. Right? Your challenge then is this. You got to find that inner, I, I call it your inner professional wrestler, like your inner macho man or Andy Savage. You don't necessarily have to be macho man or Andy Savage. But what I mean by that is when you go out and you're talking about your books, you go out and you're talking about you, you're going out, you can't sound like you're selling something. It's about something that you're being. And what I mean by that is, okay, you're very passionate about history. You're very passionate. You have your opinion about certain things. You're a knowledgeable guy. You're comfortable in those knowledgeable things. Has it occurred to you that you could teach stuff like that in a form like this? And there would be people interested in your knowledge, right? In your passion, the fact that you're bringing it out. Because that's what you're bringing to the table when you tell a story anyway. Why not just take it like, and when you look at marketing, when you look at sales, when you look at this, right? Why aren't you not doing like thinking about this? What's the story you're trying to tell people about you? And that's the thing of it like that. That will bring people that will draw people to you. Who is Brett Cousins? Why is he awesome and made of cheese? Maybe not made of cheese, but why is he awesome? What books is he proud of? And why is he so proud of the stuff he did? Because you should be. You've done four books, dude. That's awesome. Like honest to God. That's really, really awesome. And are pretty thick. <laughs> I wish I could I write, write faster, books. but I don't type with a crap. <laughs> yep. My name's Brett. I write thick books. They can also be bricks. No, no, no. I'm, I'm kidding. Yeah. I, 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 you I, get enough of these, you can make a coffee table. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that, you know that 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 that's everybody else's decision. But what I'm like, <clears throat> what I, I not trust me. I've interviewed tons of creatives, and and the thing about this is, I, and I've talked about this with some some of my friends. The majority, what I find with most creatives is they're uncomfortable with the idea that they need a persona when they're out in public because you have to be to some degree approachable. We're not in the age anymore where you can write your book and the publisher is going to sell it for you. That age is gone. That age is they done. Just tell you where to go, where to sign. You know, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. That, that, that's done. Like that doesn't exist. Even for traditional publishing, that doesn't exist anymore. What does exist now is, okay, I got, I have to, I am a businessman. I am Brett Cousins, entrepreneur, rock star. Maybe not a rock, whatever, whatever, however you, you view yourself. I'm going to go out there. 
I'm going to meet people. I'm going to be comfortable. And whatever vehicle you're comfortable in, whatever that vehicle is, I'm going to give them a bit of it. I'm going to introduce myself. I'm going to be friendly and approachable. I'm going to talk about my stories because I'm really passionate about what I do. And I'm going to go home. And then it's just about finding that. It's just about finding that way to convey that. That's the challenge. Like, like that's the um, marketing challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Every author faces today. Well, Jim, we kind of, I'm kind of doing that. Um, like on the mining side, I created five videos trying to teach guys in metallurgy the chemistry they're using because that's my strength. And on the writing side, um, I've, I've been going to, you know, when words collide. I don't know how many years in a row now. Five, I think. And then this year, it was virtual. And our group, ARWA, had gone virtual because we couldn't meet in the building we usually meet in. So we kind of had that under control, not to mention I'm fairly handy around uh, websites and stuff like that. So we've learned how to run Zoom and everything. So we ran our own channel during WWC. Mm -hmm. And I gave three presentations or two, I can't remember, plus a couple of panels. We had other people from Ottawa doing panels and presentations. We had Swati give three presentations from India. I know. Swati's on awesome. I love and, that show. and she got one. There's like 80 some people came to watch it. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. And because yeah. she was talking about the psychology of people. Yeah. <laughs> Which really helps you uh, in your character development, which I uh, I did a I did a uh, workshop on character development. Basically, you know, don't have them do something that's way out of their character. But it, it's not just it's not just your subject. Like okay, when I was doing, I've been doing when we're for for three three years there, and then last year virtually. Uh, virtually, my Zoom for whatever reason now sabotaged me on the second on the second two events i'm not sure why uh the link i provided worked and then when i went to share the link people just c c couldn't get in there for whatever i i don't know i don't understand it was what well, it was weird but the first one i had 60 people but it was my podcast panel when i was when i was when i started my podcast channel i had three people i remember the very first one i had three people in my second one i had more people it's like especially that was the year i got um nominated for the aurora it jumped and then the third year, I was, I, I thought I was in like the dead dog spot because I was at nine o'clock. I was actually late to the meeting. It was, I was terrible. And I'm sorry for everybody that had to wait for me. Although I was just very honest about it. I was having a drink with MJ and Colette and, and, and Tracy Posey and her husband got carried away. I got lost in the shuffle and I had to come down. So I'm sorry. I was having too much fun and everybody kind of forgetting me, which was great. But I had a full, I had a full house in my podcasting panel at 9 PM on the night of, um, on the night of uh, what was it? Uh, the par uh, the the um, Axel's event, Noir at the Bar. Same. I I, I, I was I was going to get anyone to show up, and I got everyone to show up. And it was it was surprising to me, but it, I realized it was partly because of the work I've done, but it's also my personality. I I, I show my personality when I go out there. I do another panel where I make uh, I have authors come and do Dr. Seuss stuff. It, it doesn't serve any purpose. I saw one of those a couple of years back. You yeah, it, it, it's great. It grew like the second year. Oh my! The second <laughs> year, I was I only did that one for two years. I had a pack house. The second, like, holy crap! Okay, this is a a strange problem to have. But everybody was coming up. It was so fun. Once everybody started playing, it was like. But again, it what I'm doing is simple stuff. But I, it's my personality, how I carry it, and and and, and the. I let people kind of be themselves and have fun. That that's the that's the vibe I try to give, even on this podcast. And I think people real sense because I'm being very genuine with that. Yeah, it carries over. It carries over in everything I do, and people want to be a part of that. So that's that's and, and again, I understand who I am as a person. So because I do that, that's what I present to people. I'm inspirational. I try to encourage people to follow their dreams. I, I, and even if I, my opinions do differ on some things, all right, people are very forgiven because again, I'm not shoving it down people's throats either. I'm just being me. And, and because I'm so genuine, it, 
a lot of criticism I think a lot of other people get in this time I didn't get because I was just I'm just this is me and that's the and that's the um that's the uh what's the term that's what I've learned about presentation and it, it's about finding where you can be the most your most genuine self without feeling like you're selling something because no one wants that feeling of hi I'm selling yeah. crap because no one wants to hear that I mean I mean I mean not, not really I want to know you as a person I want to get to know you if I really like you if I'm a fan of you then I'll, I'll definitely buy you I'll, I'll definitely give it a try um you know that's that's just me that that's maybe how yeah I do. and not all of us are, are that way yeah I, my my mother figured i have a little bit of asperger's somewhere in the back here um, i've you know enough to be weird not enough to be a genius like <laughs> but i think you signed yourself a little short there but i i i basically you know i i get into the history and i focus on it and all that stuff but for me to be doing what you do um without like a definite plan of some sort you give me a powerpoint that i'm familiar with the topic i can talk for hours but to um and i do wing it to some extent but to wing it without a sort of a a, a plan of some sort is where you know i start getting lost right. so for me like you you that that but then you know you want to talk about genuine that's me <laughs> well no but i'm going to go up there and i i'm kind of uncomfortable you with the old you don't know me but kind of a, a bit of a sales approach i suppose in that thing um if i know you i can come right up and talk to you everything fine if i don't know you i tend to lean back and that's and, that's, and, and that's me i i don't like to um I don't like to feel like I'm intruding in someone's space. That's makes me okay. Um, um, so this, for you know, when it comes to marketing, that's kind of well. You know, yeah, except, 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 except. Okay, I, I. Can I give you two suggestions? Just two. Shall okay. I write these down? Yes. <laughs> because you, you actually, I think, have the solution to your own problem. And I, I want to just. Present you like this okay there's nothing wrong with having a plan i mean i okay i the reason i can wing it like especially with interviews like this i've done them for 20 years i've had conversations with practically everybody so i there's I, i've talked to politicians i've talked to journalists scientists i literally right have no fear of looking and uh, my big advantage is I'm not afraid to look stupid and that sounds really 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 silly but the fact is i know there's going to be times when i'm talking to people i'm going to be out of my element and i'm okay with that because i'm going to approach it like okay i can learn something and that's great for me because i get something out of this besides i love getting to know people i really do it, but i mean that's always a cool thing i don't look at my deficits as a negative i look at it as a positive because i can always grow and change but that's not for everybody, and I know that. In your case, right? In your case, you're passionate about history. You're passionate about chemistry. You're passionate about the things you really know. You really know, right? Yeah. Talk about them. Like, even in the like, so even if like I I think it's I think it's strange to guys as smart as you that don't actually. Um, Explain your passions, why you love your stuff you do. Like you love particular, like you love history. Okay. What if and like this is a form of marketing, it's something you gotta consider, okay? What if you spent your time instead of marketing your book, like buy my book, because that's awkward and uncomfortable and you don't like doing it and you feel like you're intruding. Why don't you be like, hey, listen, I really love the Silk Road. I thought this was an amazing thing to write about and you can talk about why you loved it so much right and do it in a presentation you can, the fact that you need a presentation or a powerpoint slide or or something become, that's fine work that in like work that into what you do i'm serious no it, it's just funny because uh, last weekend i 
I put on three sessions of uh, sort of the book launch for the Tachi. And uh, didn't have a lot of people show up, which was a little depressing. But I had three presentations. I had a pre presentation on the history of the Silk Road, which took about 20 minutes. I had a short presentation on the Templars, because the Templars are in the book. And I had a short presentation on the uh, Scottish Wars of Independence. The first time, basically not so much on the wars, but what happened leading up to the wars. Mm -hmm. And the, the subtitle was Hereditary Rule Has Its Problems. Yes. <laughs> because Scotland kept losing people. They kept putting kids on the throne and then they die off. Well, they get the guy gets so old he doesn't have kids till he's 50. Mm -hmm. And then when he dies, he's got a four year old son on the throne. And you can't, you know, you can't run a government. <laughs> but 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 it, it, it was this is how Edward the First was able to get, stick his nose in the Scottish business because they kept having these kids end up on the throne and, the, and you know they were influenced by all kinds of other people and it, they said that I had these little presentations to do during the uh, the thing and one of the things I like watching on Facebook is. Um, you have these ver various little uh, episodes. Um, well, one of them was uh, the Great War. Once a week, they came out with what happened this week in the Great War 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. And you watched that for like four years. Yeah. And it was fascinating. But I've also seen some where they used the wrong freaking date. But they're out by 10 years. I'm thinking... Like, are you guys doing your research? <laughs> but, but, but it's gonna happen. But, but it's gonna happen when you do extra shit for your show. You're gonna make mistakes. But that's not. Yeah. What 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 I'm trying to get across to you is is this. That's the stuff you love. So why aren't yeah. you just doing that stuff on a regular basis? Like, I love interviewing people. I want to turn this into a job. So I have to ear go interview people on a regular basis. I has, has become a much more regular thing with me because I'm serious about this, right? I'm advertising myself every time I do one of these things too, right? But I'm not forcing you to buy anything either. I'm just, this is just me putting on stuff that people can listen to or watch and hopefully be inspired by or not. What, what I mean is like, you got to think about like how like you do presentations you're passionate about history. You're passionate about your work. That should be your marketing. As much like that, yeah. I, I'm just being, I, and it should be a regular thing you do because that's what you do anyway, right? So you might as well, yeah. you might as well just utilize it in a way that's beneficial to your books, right? That that's, I mean, that, that's my advice to you. You yeah. are well, like, it, it, it's been a learning curve, you know, mm -hmm. learning about this. And I got a decent microphone and I have a pretty high end camera and putting together my um, my videos. Uh, the first one is 20 minutes long. It took me months and months mm -hmm. figuring out the best way of putting it together. Sure. The following three only took about two weeks each. Yep. But, but, but I mean, <laughs> so, I've yeah. actually got to the point of the learning curve where I'm probably at, I wouldn't say at your level of, you know, doing podcasts that I could start putting these kind of things together and start a YouTube channel, blah, blah, blah. Um, never thought I'd go that way because wow. it still takes up a fair amount of time. And mm -hmm. you got trying to now, write. Though. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, this is where I, this is where I'm saying, like, I mean, this might not be so feasible when things are a little bit more saner. Maybe not. Yeah. But, I mean, right now, I mean, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I mean, I like, like myself, like this is, this is just to me, um, this is a great opportunity to meet and connect with people and get people to know that I'm out there, that I exist. I've met some incredible people in the last year and I, I legitimately enjoy this. Right. So, and I think it's contagious. Like my social followings have grown significantly in the last year, right? And I think people can sense that. You know what I mean? So 
where I'm coming from with you is, um, you gotta find that for you. Whatever that passionate, that that thing where you're gonna, you can be comfortable, or even if you're uncomfortable, you can put yourself in a position where you're comfortable enough to let people know you're out there. Because I, that's a good chunk of this business is crafting the best work you can. But the other chunk of the business is let people know you exist. Let people know that you're yeah. that you're out there. That's the other half of the battle. And if you're gun shy about marketing, you, 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 you probably shot yourself in the foot. I'm just saying that because it's, it's just a matter of finding the right kind of marketing. Exactly. What, me. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. That's it. Like everybody, you don't have to do what I do. In fact, I, I hope you don't. I hope you find your own way. Maybe hopefully it's better so I can learn from you. Right. Yeah. But, but, but I mean, it's amazing to me. Like I, I, there's so many people I've met, I've talked to that know so much and are so passionate about their own stuff. And it, and the solution to me has always been find those passions and let people know they're out there. Because even if the audience isn't big, it's yours and they'll buy your stuff. Yeah. Right. And then one day, yeah. and then one day that that's my advice, man, that they, that's, I, I hope I'm not sounding too preachy saying that, but <laughs> Don't worry. If I become successful, one of the guys I'm going to be thanking is you. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks. I guess. I hope you do. I hope you do. Like it, it's it's. Well, sometimes question. you never know what's going to work. Like I said, I didn't have oh, a lot yeah, of no. people show up for my uh, for my um, launch, and then I went on Facebook the other day and said, "If you like, you know, to all my friends on Facebook, if you want to sign copy of my new novel, let me know." And here's the email address. And uh, this one's heading out the door. It's number 24. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going, it, how did it get that easy when I couldn't get anything else to work? Oh, and it's just like, oh, what? I, I would try all kinds of book launches. And no one would come to my book launches. Like, no one. <clears throat> but everybody has come to my presentations. Yeah. And, I, and that's so, like, for me, that's that's so for me, I mean, I need to do more presentations. I'm doing a bunch in February, right? So that's that's it, right? I can, I, so again, that works for me. Everybody's a little different, right? Everybody's a little different what works. There's some people that crush book launches. I, I mean, I love what Adam does. I love what Susie does. I love what, oh, yeah. right? They crush it. Like they know what they're doing and you can learn from them. And, and even if the book launch doesn't necessarily hit me the same way, um, you know, in Calgary, I use some of what I've learned from others, like for people like them in my presentations, because it works, right? So that's, like, like I said, there's different ways to market. There's different ways to, um, there's different ways to tell a story, right? Ultimately, it's how, it's how you best tell it for yourself. I think that's the challenge everybody does in marketing needs to learn, right? And writing, like, authors learn with marketing. And some people it's easier than others. Like again, maybe you're not the guy to be the most personable guy out the door. Maybe not, but maybe. But, but I bet you you are the guy that. But you are the guy people go to for information. You're good at that. Yeah. So put yourself in positions where those that information will help you, man. Yeah, on the mining side, people keep trying to pick my brain for free. <laughs> charge them. I had to put the kibosh on that eventually. Well, no. Charge Seriously, them. you want me to come down and fix your place? Great. Don't try to pick my brain over a phone call. <laughs> well, that, because that, you'll do it wrong anyway. <laughs> well, well, I, I, I look at, I look at the fact that I don't mind helping anybody, but I'm also at that point too with myself, my own expertises. I charge. I have to. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think the most powerful thing I've learned as I've gotten older is no is a thing. You must say no um it, it's one of the hardest it's a hard word to say sometimes but it's ultimately one of the most powerful words you can say is no no i'm not going to go out of my way for this no i'm not going to no if you want me here make it worth my time you want me to help you make it, and not and again i'm not about helping people right it, it's more like i just recognize what my expertise is valuable so i'm going to treat it like it is valuable same with you. Yeah. 
right? Right? I'll do it for free if it's for me. I'll do it, right? But not not for necessarily not not necessarily for anyone else, and that's and I mean I I am gonna be talking about that on my freelancing thing when I do Leftbridge in uh, February, so I'm looking forward to that. And I, I talk about I'm actually a good chunk of that is learning how to say no. Ironically enough, it's one of the biggest lessons I've learned as a freelancer. So yeah, yeah. Just out of curiosity, do you have uh, I'm looking at your screen and it says there's like one person watching, and I'm assuming that's me. No, it's not. So do you know how many people are watching this right now? Right now? I don't know. One person for sure. And then afterwards, it, 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 it'll play. Uh, on my Twitch stream, I usually get a, a couple dozen people. On my podcast, I get another dozen people right away, and then it adds up. Well, oh, So not too many people watch this live. They pick it up it, later. It, it, it can vary. Like, it varies. Like, I've had – so Hank Philip Orion, when I had interviewed her – I had a hundred, I had a few hundred people show up and watch it. Right. So yeah. it, it really varies on the guest and it, and it varies on the topic. I've had points in this where the numbers have gone up. I've seen my numbers that go up for a little bit and then drop and then go up and then drop. It depends. My drink and draws do well. Um, right. And, and like I said, like anything else, it's, I mean, I'm expanding. Like I said, this has been, this is my second month doing this, man. So yeah. the, fact, the fact of the matter is, I mean, it, there are days it's going to go like this. There are days it's going to go like this. There are days it's going to go like this. There are days it's going to go like this. Eventually, it's just going to keep going up and up and up and up. And up. It's the yeah. idea, right? Well, people should enjoy this. Like we solved American politics. We talked about human nature. <laughs> oh, I haven't solved American politics. I'm not saying I'm not saying I solved American <laughs> politics. Uh -uh. <laughs> God damn, no. All I pointed, all I pointed out, and I've said this to many people, is history is just constantly repeating itself in the United States. That's it. No, not just there. Oh no, everywhere. But the fact of the matter is, if you want to look at the American politics, look at where where they've been, and you can figure out where they're going. Go on. That's yeah. it. That's it. Brett, I think we have an interview here. What do you think? Yeah, it's been an hour and a bit. It's been an hour and a bit. I didn't know how long you normally Very. do these, so we just kept the hammer in. Well, no, that's but that I've so I've done I've gone two hours. I, I I I've done two hour interviews. I've done forty five minute interviews. It it varies um, based on like you know times and availability. Honestly, um, tomorrow I'm going to be going at least ninety minutes, right? With my with my drink and draw, it's going to be about ninety. So, I mean, it, it varies and it's fun and it's different and that's the thing. And when this is over, I'll see how many people view it. Like I said, on average, I, at this point on my Facebook, on my Facebook video thing, it jumps. Like I'll probably have something like, I'll look at 30 views right now. And then by the, tomorrow, it'll be closer to 69, like 60 to 90 views, maybe more. It really depends. So. You'll, okay. Yeah. So many. So you'll have at least. You will have at least a, a hundred plus people that will have watched this on some level. When this okay. Well, well, I'll post. I just just did this on Facebook. That's what. <laughs> hey, Something hey. I probably should have done before, mm -hmm. but uh, it's just with the, uh, that the, basically in a seminar, uh, basically a video conference over the last three days. So it's not a whole lot time to do anything else. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, that's that's what you do. So on that note, then, why don't you tell everybody about your latest book, how people can find you, and then I'll wrap the show up. Okay, latest book, book four of the Rainy Chronicles, called Atashi. Atashi refers to the hereditary sword of the Rainy family. That's been going, it's, this story tells them how they got it. In all the books, uh, the sword is sort of a constant. Um, in the later books, of course, they never use it. It's just strapped to their back as a good luck charm. <laughs> you know, when you start using guns, a sword's kind of a bad thing to bring to a sword. A uh, sword's a bad thing to come bring to a uh, gunfight. <laughs> so this takes place. Uh, there's a, a Scottish uh, man who needs to get out of Scotland because he's uh, being chased by a powerful earl. 
and he finds himself in the Holy Land and joins a caravan and goes across uh, Asia and ends up in Japan, where he basically acquires a sword. And then he comes home. And the final scene is at the Battle of Bannockburn. Bannockburn, depending on how you want to pronounce it. So it's, uh, it's a rollicking adventure with uh, some good characters. I'm told I do character development very well through all my books. And uh, that takes place uh, in the waning years of the Silk Road. Very cool. Okay. So I'm just finding history. How can people find you? Uh, my website is www.glenkeltybooks.com, where you can see a little picture of me and a little bio. And the books are available. You can buy them right on there, or you can search for them on Amazon. You put in B G cousins with B period G period cousins, you'll see all four books show up. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that will do it for this episode of Just Josh. And if you want to support the podcast, you can support me on Patreon. Buy me a coffee. Uh, the links will be in the description below tomorrow. If you want to watch them, if you are watching this, they'll be there. Um, if you want to buy my books? Buy my books. Or you want to subscribe? Hit my Twitch.tv slash Just Josh and Podcast. For my YouTube channel, Joshua Pantoloresco. Stay inspired. Keep shining in the darkness. See you guys tomorrow at the Lane of Dorothy. Okay. One quick question. 